All right, folks, in this video lecture, we are going to cover lecture 13, which talks about the remaining two market structures, monopolistic market structure and oligopoly market structure. So in, in the last two, uh, in, the, in the last couple of video lectures, we have discussed uh, uh, that there are four different types of market structures and we specifically discuss in details the perfect competition or peer competition as well as the monopoly, uh, monopoly market structure. So in this video lecture, in lecture 13, we will co cover the remaining two uh, the market structures. Monopolistic, first we will cover monopolistic market structure and then we will cover oligopoly market structure. So we will start with um, a general uh, term called imperfect competition. So basically imperfect competition is a model, um, it's, it's a model other than the perfect competition. So when we talked about monopoly, that is an imperfect competition. Um, and it also includes oligopoly and monopolistic competition. So other than perfect competition or pure competition, all the other different types of um, market structures we have, monopoly, monopolistic, and oligopoly are called are categorized under imperfect competition. And what imperfect competition means is if there is less efficiency, and the cost is higher, and output is also lower. Um, you know, in a perfect competition, we will have the maximum output, lowest price and lowest cost for the uh, producers as well. But in this type of imperfect competition market structure, uh, there will be um, l cost will be high, output will be low, and that means there will be less efficiency. And as I said, oligopoly and mon monopolistic market structures are also classified under this category. Now, one thing you must remember is you must not confuse a monopolistic market structure with a monopoly uh, market structure. Uh, those two are very different. Uh, you know, a monopoly market structure is where there is only one producer or one firm operating in the industry and there is no competition at all. Uh, whereas monopolistic market structure is competitive and it's, it's, it, there are an, a number of firms in the market and there is competition in there. Okay, and as we move on, you will understand um, more about the monopolistic market. So the characteristics of a monopolistic market structure or monopolistic competition are there are many farms that are computing. So uh, competing. So in other words, there are many producers in the market. Then there are many buyers. Um, you know, lot of consumers. So for uh, these type of products, it can be compared. You know, these these characteristics are very similar to a perfect competition, right? There are many producers and there are many um, buyers. Now, the third characteristic is product differentiation, and that is the most uh, significant characteristic of this type of market structure. In pure competition, we had identical product or homogeneous products, but in this type of market structure, the monopolistic market structure, we uh, the products are differentiated. Okay, um, in, uh, the, uh, and then we also have price competition as well as non-price competition. So in this type of market structure, um, you know the competitors, the producers or the firms will compete with one another not only based on price, but they will um, uh, compete on other factors such as location, quality, customer service, other stuff. So th those things are important in this type of market structure. The fifth characteristic of th this type of market structure is this easy entry and easy exit into the market. So anyone can easily enter into the market or anyone can easily um, exit the market anytime. And finally, the products are similar. So this is the most important part, right? We are saying product differentiation, but we are also saying products are similar. So that's what makes it unique. Let's, let's think about the restaurant industry. All the restaurants in, let's say in Dallas, provide food. So the products are similar. They, uh, all the restaurants uh, uh, provide us with food or d dinner or lunch items, and they are similar products, right? But the differentiation is where we have Chinese restaurants, we have Mexican restaurants, we have fast food restaurants. So that's how the products are differentiated. Although the products are similar, they are differentiated, and that helps them to separate from one another as well as compete in the market. Again, in this slide, it talks about that a perfect example of monopolistic competition would be the retail operations, the retail industry, such as Tom Thumb, Kroger, um, Albertsons, um, um, Safeway. So the, the, all these 
uh, you know, they have similar products and services, but they the products are still differentiated and there is competition. There are many farms, there are many retail outlets out there, there is competition. Um, but the competition is not based on price only. The competition is probably based on the location. The competition is probably based on customer service, on the brand name. So lots of things um, are uh, involved in this type of market um, structure. And the, in this type of market structure, there is no collusion between the producers. So when I say there is no collusion, what it means is one producer or one farm is not make, um, uh, uh, making an agreement with another farm. You know, in this type of market structure, this does not ex exist. Uh, let's say Kroger, they're making a deal with a Tom Thumb uh, to charge a set price to, to the uh, consumers so that would be collusion but in this type of monopolistic market structure we do not have any collusion between the farms so the again as i said the most distinguishing feature or the most distinct feature of this type of market structure is the product differentiation uh, although the products are similar they are uh, differentiated based on customer needs you know based on what the customers want they and they customize the products in such a way uh, that the products are differentiated now competition um, in this type of market structure includes um, you know the presentation of products you know how they are presenting the products such as the sales atmosphere uh, like you know many people prefer to shop um, in uh, Tom Thumb or Kroger as opposed to Walmart because it's a more cozy environment more uh, upscale environment as opposed to Walmart so that that gives it uh, that makes it differentiated than Walmart then the location is it very close to my house is it is it like 15 miles from my house so, so that's an important factor then customer service right how the employees are treating us um, in many grocery stores you will see you know the customers are coming and helping you checking out they are uh, giving you directions but let's say in Walmart uh, there's not much you know people are the employees are busy with stacking the inventory and all that we don't get a whole lot of customer service so that's another way they compete as well as some other feature that gives the goods and services a unique appeal maybe one of the uh, grocery store is providing some goods that are very different from the goods that are offered in the other foods an example would be whole foods you know they provide organic food like every store provides organic but whole food is very different because or the central market is very different you know because they offer fresh farm produce as well as organic produce um, another thing uh, you know the retail stores make goods and services different through their marketing designs you know how they market their product how they advertise their product is also important you know such as expensive department let's say central market or whole food market store markets they uh, you know market the service them at most fair makes a difference you know how what's the what's the customer service what is the environment inside the uh, grocery store so for expensive department stores those are the focus whereas for inexpensive stores such as you know walmart or a local grocery store um, the focus is on lower prices or or consumer con uh, convenience you know they can easily go there or they can uh, do check cashing services and uh, you know most likely in Walmart we will have cheaper products than we have in Tom Thumb or than we have in Kroger so again you know uh, grocery store is a perfect example you know there are small grocery stores without any brand names and then we have the bigger brand names out there um, and it depends on what people prefer, you know, so location, ease, uh, how easily we can access the grocery store, um, that de depends, uh, uh, that decides a lot of things. Like, let's say for small local grocery stores, um, you know, the main uh, factor is it's easily accessible and it's very close to usually a neighborhood and people can easily access that. While, uh, whereas departmental stores such as Kroger or TomTom, Tom, they usually have a customer following or loyal customers. Um, you know they will go there to do all their grocery um, because of the atmosphere customer service and environment um, so you know that's how they differentiate how they will serve their customers and how they will differentiate their products now we talked about uh, the graphs of um, you know the demand and cost relationship graphs um, in a perfect competition in monopoly comp in, a, in a monopoly market structure same way we have to look into the demand um, um, the revenue relationships as well as the cost relationship 
um, for a monopolistic firm or for a firm operating in a monopolistic competition market structure. Now, the, the cost and revenue relationships in this type of market structure is the same as a monopoly. You know, like the, 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 the type of graph we had in monopoly, in a monopolistic market structure, we are going to have the same type of scenario. However, the only the, 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 the reason they are the same, but the reason for the similarity are different are different okay so even though the relationships are the same they are same for different economic reasons and we will explain that in a bit and in this type of market structure again profit is maximized at the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost and when each charges a higher price and produces less then the lowest cost unit uh, output per unit is given Okay, so let me quickly again draw the graph, um, how the graph or how the revenue and cost relationship graphs will look like for a monopolistic firm. Again, it will be very similar to um, a monopoly firm. So let's say we have this graph. So we will have a downward sloping demand curve. If you remember, for a monopoly, the a demand curve was downward sloping. The marginal revenue curve, it started where the demand curve starts but then it is always less than the demand curve and there will be a gap or a separation between the demand and the marginal revenue curve so in this type of uh, market structure marginal revenue curve will always be less than uh, price or marginal revenue will always be less than price now for the cost it is very similar we will have the marginal cost curve we will have the average, oops, oops, sorry. Let me draw it again. So this is the marginal revenue. Then we have the marginal cost curve. Very similar. And then we, all, we, all, we will also have the average total cost curve. Okay. So now, if you see again, Profit is maximized where marginal revenue is equals to marginal cost. So that is this point. This is the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. So again, just like monopoly, this is the quantity that will be produced in the market. The price that will be charged in this market will be equals to P and the cost to the producers will be C. Okay, that's where the firms will be producing their output, that will be their cost, and that will be the price they will be charging to the borrowers. Now again, look at this scenario, they, it is not efficient, right? Because probably the efficient point is here, where marginal cost curve cuts the average total cost curve, and that is the point where it also hits the demand curve. That's the point where average total cost is minimum. This is the point where it's minimum, but... We are not operating at this point. We are actually operating here. So that means we are not cost efficient and we are charging a higher price. So that means the market is inefficient. So a monopolistic market structure, as I said in the beginning of the lecture, is categorized under imperfect competition, which means higher cost. Higher cost, you know, if you see it's higher, the cost is higher than the lowest average total cost output lower output and that means less efficiency or inefficiency so this is how the graph of a monopolistic structure or market structure will look like very similar to a uh, very similar to a monopoly market structure however the reason they look uh, alike are um, are different okay and we will discuss that in in a bit so here you go, uh, you know, firms in a monopolistic competition will always operate at a higher point on the average total cost curve than the minimum. You know, if the average total cost, cost will always be higher uh, than the minimum average total cost in a monopolistic competition, just like a monopoly. A monopoly does that because of high barriers to entry. A monopoly will do that in order to for high barriers to entry when you have high costs others will not be able to enter the market easily because that means they will have to make a lot of investment to reach that point so that's why the monopoly operates there however a firm in a monopolistic competition 
operates there because of excess capacity. Again, remember in a monopolistic competition, one of the characteristic is easy and um, easy entry and exit into the market. So you know that's not the reason why they are operating at a higher um, average total cost. Um, they are basically operating it because of excess capacity. So in other words, I, we can say that a monopoly probably intentionally operates at higher cost so that um, competitors cannot enter the market and they can pose barriers to entry. Whereas monopolistic competition, they are not doing it intentionally. They are doing it because of excess capacity, you know, um, because they have to customize the products based on what the consumers want, right? Um, you know, they are not producing identical products. They have to customize it. They have to um, uh, hear what customers want. And based on that, they have to differentiate their product. And as a result, they won't be able to incur low cost when they are trying to differentiate the products, when they are trying to make the products different than their competitors, what will happen? Their, their cost will go up. And as a result, price will go up. So they are not doing it intentionally. Um, they are doing it because when they see customers have customized needs, they will differentiate it. And as a result, the cost will go up. So they will charge higher prices, which will make them inefficient. So that's the main reason. Although monopoly and uh, monopolistic have the same cost and revenue relationships, uh, they don't have the same relationship because they have the same relationship because of different reasons. For monopoly, they do it intentionally just to maintain high barriers to entry. And for monopolistic, they have to customize their product, differentiate their products. As a result, um, you know, the cost goes up and, and they become um, uh, less efficient. So, you know, firms in a monopolistic market offers customers more services um, in a unique at atmosphere as well as a lot of choices. This ultimately results in higher costs, you know, because they have to focus a lot on how the atmosphere of the store. Let's think about retail stores, how how they can maintain a good atmosphere, um, what type of different, what are the different choices they can offer to the customers, uh, what are the customer preferences. So based on that, they will um, uh, operate in the market, which will cause them to incur higher costs. Okay. So another thing that is very important in monopolistic competition is advertising. Um, advertising plays a very important role in this type of market structure because, you know, the products are differentiated. They have to perform advertising to compete with one another. Basically, it's a mean of relating advantages to consumers since perceived or real product differences are, in, uh, are important. You know, they, when they are selling the product, if they are advertising and marketing it, people will know about it. People will know how different the product is compared to the competitors. And that will probably attract their customers. That will probably create um, a customer base for them. So that's why adv advertising is very important because their products are differentiated. If you think in a monopoly, advertising is not that important because he, he's there is only one producer and they are the one only producing um, uh, the same, uh, the good, right? There's no competition. They have people in public relations, you know, just to maintain, uh, you know, pe uh, the government relations as well as, you know, some um, other uh, supplier relationships. Uh, but in a monopolistic farm, they have to sell the product. Um, you know, their products are differentiated compared to their uh, competitors. So they have to advertise to let the consumers know. Similarly, in a perfect competition or pure competition, advertising is not necessary because products are identical. A cabbage produced by me and a cabbage produced by uh, um, uh, Leonardo is going to be the same. There's, if I advertise it, it's not that Leonardo's cabbage is different. It's the same. So it does not make sense. We, we, that's why we don't see any advertisement for cabbage or carrots, right? It doesn't make any sense because the products are identical. OK, but um, but in reality, when when the firms are engaging in advertising, these are the things that will happen. It will stimulate product development. That is the changes in product to better meet the consumer needs. It will promote comp competition. Like when I will engage in advertising, uh, you know, I will have more consumers. And then when another firm will look at it, they will also start doing marketing and then 
it goes on competition goes on and finally it provides information to consumers right your products are differentiated but how will the consumers know if you're not telling them about it if you're not um, going and uh, if they do not know about it they will not know advertising and market marketing is the way they will know and you know in this case national media such as the television radio magazines they play an important role um, in advertising these type of products to the consumers so basically advertising is important because it stimulates product development it brings about competition and it also provides the consumers with the necessary information about the product now of course when farms do advertising it's not free right they also have to spend a lot of money on advertising they have to have a separate budget on advertising which eventually increases their cost which is one of the reasons why you will see they are not operating at their lowest average total cost because they're because they are engaging advertising activities marketing activities that cost is going up okay some economists believe that these are actually these ad, in, in advertising expenditures which results in increase in cost are viable you know that it makes sense that, that that some of the economists say that it makes sense because although it increases cost but at the same time it is also increasing your sales which eventually leads to higher economies of scales and thus consumer prices but this is not always true you know our advertising generally increases price and it results in payments to individuals with higher incomes it also promotes inefficient allocation of resources you know sometimes uh, when when a competitor is advertising heavily and trying to uh, subdue the other competitors what will happen is they uh, eventually he, that firm might become a monopoly so it, it, it has its downsides okay so Advertising is important, but it also increases your cost, makes them less inefficient. Sometimes it can lead to the creation of monopoly. So, so we have to look on the both sides. <coughs> now, the demand curve, or when we look at the elasticity of demand for a monopolistic competitive firm, that is determined by two things. You know, <coughs> number one is the number of firms competing in this market structure okay so for example water bottles or bottled water tends to be readily available at many locations and tends to be elastic to price when i say elastic to price means when if you increase your price demand will go down and revenue will go down because water bottles are very similar and if let's say the water bottle for ozark ozarka goes up price for Ozarka goes up, people will probably switch to Nestle water bottles, right? Because the products are very similar. So depends on the number of competing firms. If there is a lot of competing firms, then the elasticity will be elastic or the, the demand elasticity will be elastic because the consumers will be more sensitive to the changes in prices because there are so many options available. If one firm increases the price, the consumer will just switch to the other firms. The other thing that affects the demand elasticity of these type of firms is the customer perception of similarity or uniqueness of the product. Okay, so again, if the if the consumers think that the products of the competing firms are very similar, in that case, they will be elastic, right? And if because if I think um, if I think the let's say a water bottle produced by Fernanda. Um, is very similar to the water bottle, water bottle produced by Daud, then, you know, I will be very price elastic, right? If Fernanda increases her price, water price for the water bottle, I will just switch to Daud and buy the water bottle from him, right? So, so how the consumers perceive, if they perceive that the competing firms have similar products, they will be elastic. But if they perceive that the products are very different, or they are very differentiated from one another. Let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mrs. Baird's bake, uh, Mrs. Baird's bread versus Sara Lee's uh, bread. And if I, if I, as a consumer, think Sara Lee's bread is more, um, you know, more tasty than Mrs. Baird's uh, uh, bread, then I will uh, be inelastic to the price changes if i am buying sarah lee's even if there is an increase in price i will probably not switch to 
Mrs. Baird's because I think this product is different than Mrs. Baird and I will keep on buying this and I will be inelastic. And that's why, you know, some brand names, you know, some uh, unique names or brand names tend to be more unique and thereby less price elastic or in other words, inelastic. So people are less sensitive to changes in prices because we think this product is very unique and there's not a substitute easily available for this type of product. In the short run, a firm in a monopolistic competitive firm can earn pro economic profit or can make loss uh, or just make normal profit. Okay, so any one of the three can happen. They can make a loss, they can make a profit, economic profit, or they can make just normal profit. Normal profit means total revenue minus total cost is equal to zero. So when the average total cost a curve is above the price, that's when they are going to have short-term loss. Now, if it is less than the price, that's then they will have a profit. So in the case, if the, so when I'm saying they are having loss, the curve will look like this. Let me show you. So let's say this is the graph. Again, this is your demand curve. This is your marginal revenue curve. And let's say this is your marginal cost curve. And we know this is the profit maximizing point, but average total cost is like this. Okay, so in this case, if you say this is the profit maximizing point, and if we go up, this is the price, and this is the cost. So this, the, the if you see the cost is greater than the in this case, the cost is greater than the price, right? C is greater than price. So this is this shaded rectangle is the loss, short term loss that the firm is going to make because again, they are charging lower prices, but they are incurring higher costs. So definitely they are making losses because their cost is higher than the revenue they are receiving. So in that case, they will earn uh, losses in the short term. So if they are earning losses in the short term, what will happen in the long run? In the long run, the firms that are making losses will leave the industry because there is it's easy to leave the industry or it's easy to leave the market. So they will leave the industry and then these losses will be driven out, bringing the market back to normal profit. On the other case, if the firm is um, making profit, again, let's say the firm is making profit. In this case, basically, uh, the average total cost curve is below the demand curve. So let's say this is the marginal cost curve and this is the average total cost curve. And then profit maximizing point is here where MR is equal to MC. This is your quantity. If you go straight up when you hit the demand curve and go parallelly to the Y axis, that's your price. And if you go straight up and you hit the average total cost curve and go parallelly to left, that's your cost. In this case, price is greater than cost. Right, so they are making profit. This shaded region is the profit that the firms are making in the short run in a monopolistic firm. Now, if this exists, what will happen in the short? What will happen in the long run? In the long run, basically, when others will see, oh, hey, Nafis is making so much profit, then you know what will happen is basically Mason, um, uh, then uh, Daud, then uh, Diego, Fernanda, they will start joining the market and as a result this excess profit will be driven out because of more competition and um, everyone will start making normal profit in the long run where total revenue is equal to total cost. So that's in a nutshell that's about monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition you know the main focus is the products are differentiated and because of that you know they they incur higher costs for which they become uh, less efficient um, and also you know basically uh, an example would be the retail industry or the restaurant industry are good examples of the monopolistic competition so then we look into our last market structure which is the oligopoly market structure um, this is this one is the most uh, tricky or most complicated one to understand. Um, this is the type of market structure in which 
a few firms operate or a few there are a few uh, producers in this type of market maybe three or four or maybe six or seven or maybe nine or ten firms operating in this type of market structure so it's somewhere in between monopolistic competition and monopoly market structure again in this guy in this case the average total cost is higher and this type of market structure is inefficient it's it's not efficient only perfect competition is inefficient is efficient all the other types of market structure are inefficient um, there are a couple of firms and uh, basically um, they are the ones who run the industry and sometimes it's very difficult to analyze this type of market structure because you know products Sometimes the products can be identical. Sometimes the products can be differentiated. Like in perfect competition, we know the products are identical. In monopolistic competition, we know the products are um, differentiated. But in this type of market structure, products can be identical or products can be different. For instance, the steel industry or concrete, concrete industry, they hear the products are identical. Like steel is identical to one another, but we only have a couple of handful of firms producing steel. Okay, even though the products are identical, there is only probably four or five firms producing steel. But products can also be heterogeneous or different or differentiated, such as the automobile industry. You know, um, Ford, uh, Toyota, um, uh, Honda, their products, they are still the same uh, product, car, but they're differentiated, right? So they can be homogeneous or they can be uh, differentiated. Now, the characteristics of this type of market structure are that the economies of scale restrict the number of producers. What it means is basically, if I draw a graph, what it means is in this type of market structure, it requires a large capital investment. So uh, you need to spend a lot of money in order to start, type of, start this type of uh, business. Automobile industry, airline industry, if you think about that, you cannot just... Um, start an airline industry tomorrow if you want to. You will need a lot of capital. You will need a lot of investors in order to start that um, uh, farm, right? Like, but in as opposed a restaurant industry, probably most of us can probably start that very fairly soon because we don't have to spend that much, which is a monopolistic competition. So what it's saying is the capital investment is so much that the more you produce, the output goes up the more you produce the economies of scale is enjoyed so the long run average cost curve in this type of market structure looks like this so economies of scale is enjoyed for a long period of time and as they produce more and more because the fixed cost is high in this type of market structure and therefore as they produce more and more they enjoy more economies of scale and therefore it is very difficult for a new firm to enter in this type of market structure no no a new firm will not have this much of capital that they can easily invest and start making a mark if i want tomorrow i cannot just go ahead and start a brand that will create automobiles that's not possible it because uh, it's a very capital intensive uh, in type of industry so that why that's why firms may have economies of scales because of high startup cost you know the fixed cost is very high you know such as for car manufacturing so if you produce more and more the cost goes keeps going down and therefore you enjoy economies of scale for a long period of time now another characteristic of oligopoly is the the few firms we have they will have ownership of raw materials you know in this type of market um, uh, model some firms will control the resources uh, that they need to produce the goods and services you know like in maybe if we think about the automobile industry maybe they control uh, they have ownership of some steel or some aluminium or some glass so that would be an example of this characteristic then another thing is advertising may be too costly for many producers the firms engage in extensive advertising and marketing in this type of market structure they spend a lot of money on, on advertising budget so it's not easy for any firm to just afford these high costs so that will act as a barriers to entry and therefore advertising may be too costly for many producers in this type of market structure finally you know government restriction may exist on a number of producers you know like government may grant firms the right to license their patented product to produce through um, other firms 
uh, this only allows um, uh, you no know, those licenses by inventory to access the market you know so uh, sometimes government rest, uh, restrictions may exist on a number of producer which will prevent others from entering the market they are protecting these few farms and therefore others are not able to enter the market so these are the characteristics of oligopoly now another thing another interesting thing that we need to know is concentration ratio this is basically a measure that helps us to calculate the degree of fewness um, so that the degree of fewness is measured by concentration ratio in other words basically it is the percentage of market held by the top four producers in the industry so how much of the market share is held by the top four producers of the market um, that is called the concentration ratio okay so let me do a quick example and this will be in your homework uh, this homework that I'm giving so make sure you uh, understand this example so let's say we look at the airline industry we are given with the airline industry which is a oligopoly market structure okay so we have Southwest Airlines they control 29% of the market share. We have United Airlines. They control 17% of the market share. Then we have Delta Airlines. They control 15% of market share of the airline industry. Then we have American Airlines. They control 21%. Then we have Spirit. They control 8%. Then we have JetBlue Airlines. They control 3%. And all the other airlines control the remaining 7% of the market share of the airline industry. So we are given with this information. Now, if based on the definition, I will ask you what is the concentration ratio of the airline industry what is the concentration ratio of the airline industry now remember what is the definition of concentration ratio it is the percentage of market share held by the top four producers in the market so in this case who are the top four we we are given here so definitely southwest is number one so yeah that's that will be included so southwest 29 percent Plus, who's next? American Airlines is 21%. So we will include American Airlines, which is the next top market share. Then we have United, right? 17%. So United is 17%. And we are left with Delta 15, Spirit 8%, JetBlue 3%, other 7%. So definitely Delta. And that's 15%. So if we add all these numbers, we will get 82%. And this 82% is called the concentration ratio of the airline industry, meaning these top four firms control 82% of the market share of the airline industry. Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, United Airlines, and Delta Airlines these four firms control 82% of the airline industry. The rest is less. So you can definitely see that the top four producers are controlling most of the market structure, more than 80% of the market structure. So um, that's a big thing. So in oligopoly market structure, we will use this ratio to see what is the percentage. The higher this is, it's probably closer to a monopoly. Uh, so that's how that's a very important measure. Uh, and if you look at uh, go back to the slide and see you know in your tobacco uh, the concentration ratio is 99.3 percent that means four farms in, uh, to, in the tobacco industry control 99 percent of the industry in breweries 90 percent is controlled by four farms in the breakfast cereal 92 percent is controlled by uh, four farms in the automobile industry 91 percent is controlled by these are these numbers have are, are statistics that we obtained from uh, economic sites so this is an important thing 
Now, since there are few farms in the market, there we don't have a lot of producers in this market, right? There's only a few farms, probably five or six or seven or eight farms in this type of market structure. So each farm is interdependent on one another's price. What I so let's say in this type of market structure, the four producers are or there are five producer, and that's let's say that's me, Fernanda, Diego, um, and Mason and um, um, let's say Ishita okay so we are the five producers in the market and then we all of us are dependent on each other's price what I am charging the, four, the remaining four of you are dependent on that or what Ishita is charging the other four are dependent on that price so if uh, in a standardized type of oligopoly structure if there is a change in price by me then all the other four will also change their price so it will significantly impact the other four and they will also change the price so in this type of market structure we rarely see a price war or competition based on price so the economic position of a firm in this type of market structure um, can be analyzed through game theory you know now game theory is a very specialized type of concept and if you take higher level economics class you will start understanding what game theory is but it's so for now just know that game theory is basically a model that um, helps you to find out expected results from different business strategies basically uh, when you take the different strategies or when you take different business strategies what are the different results you will get and based on that you make a decision so that's what game theory is okay but when you take higher classes you will probably know more it's a little bit more complicated uh, so but we use that theory in the oligopoly market structure what this theory says that farms in this type of market structure makes more profit if they are cooperating with one another uh, so again, let's say we, the five of us, me, Daud, uh, Fernanda, Diego, and Ishita, if we are cooperating with one another in the industry, um, if we are making a pact among one another that, okay, in the market, all of us, we're, we are going to charge $10 per unit, then it's more beneficial for all five of us. Um, but if, if we start price war, then it is hurting everyone else in the market. So they basically, they do not engage in price wars. Now, oligoly, oligopoly farms will e infrequently change prices. So most farms will, in this type of market structure, will not change their prices. Uh, but if there is an increase in their cost of production, then you know one farm will increase the cost, and the, then the other farms will also increase their price. So it's just there's a price leader, and then based on the action of the price leader, the others will also follow and do the same thing. Let's say the airline industry, we, are, we, we, we know that Southwest Airlines seems to be the price leader. So if the price of oil goes up, Southwest Airlines usually raises the prices of tickets and basically then the others, American Airlines, Delta, United, follow Southwest Airlines and increase their price as well because they are not engaging in any type of price war. <coughs> in the farms in our oligopoly market structure, can also engage in collusive behavior okay what that means is basically the firms come together and they set market price and set market share and this is known as collusion so let's say again the five of us me diego fernanda dauda and ishita we are the five of us operating in a market structure and we say that each of us we will charge 20 dollar per unit and each of us will have 20 percent share in the market or each of us will control 20% of the market share. <coughs> so that is, excuse me, so that is called collusion. When the firms are coming together and setting the market price and also setting what each firm's market share will be, mine 20%, Ishita's 20%, Diego's 20%, Dauda's 20%, and Fernandez 20%. It does not have to be equal you know I can have 30% and maybe she has 10% if she is a smaller firm but as an example I'm saying that we determine that this will be our market share and this is what we're going to charge we are making a compact or we are making an agreement among ourselves that we will do that that is called collusion now when this agreement is in writing when we have a written agreement then it is called cartel 
So when collusion is in written form, then it is called cartel. In U.S., collusion or cartels are um, illegal. They are not uh, allowed by the law. However, if other countries have cartel, then you know we are engaged in international trade. So if other countries have cartel, it can affect our consumers as well. You know, when I say cartel, you probably heard about cartel. Even these days, there's a lot of talks in the news about the cartel between Saudi Arabia and Russia. So you know, the example of cartel is the oil cartel. You know, so when when they um, when global cartels are making some changes, it affects American prices also. Now, one last thing about oligopoly is basically we also have to look at the demand curve, the marginal revenue and marginal cost curve. Now, in this type, this is a very different scenario compared to the other market structure. They will have a kinked demand curve. So basically, what I mean by kinked is um, they will have two basically they will have two um, they will have two lines the demand curve will be comprised of two lines okay so let's say this is the demand curve and then this is the demand this is the, also the demand curve so the, these two lines make up the demand curve in an oligopoly market structure uh, let me do it more clearly so the, the, the demand curve has two lines one portion portion is the elastic portion and one portion is the inelastic portion and that makes up the demand curve of a oligopoly farm so the one is elastic which is above the prevailing price and the other is inelastic which is below the prevailing price. So, so where these two curves meet this point and when we hit this point that is the market price. So at this point we have market price okay in the, in the industry for that for that farm uh, operating in the oligopoly farm and then this is the demand curve this is the inelastic region which is below the market price and this is the elastic region which is above the market price okay and now the marginal revenue curve will also be therefore different it will start here but from here it will again be like this so there will be two marginal revenue curves which is odd I know but that's how it looks like you know the marginal revenue curve and then you know marginal cost curve will be this but in this type of market structure um, profit is not maximized you know we, we don't go by the point where profit is maximized because we have a pact we have an agreement with one another what we are going to charge so we are not going to charge at the point where MR is equal to MC so that's an important thing to pay the the market price is basically the point where uh, the two demand lines are intersecting and this is the point where the market price will be okay and again d2 is the elastic where anything above the price is elastic region so consumers are more sensitive in this region and this region is inelastic so consumers are um, uh, inelastic or less sensitive to price changes in this region so what will happen, what it means is basically if a farm raises its price above existing price, the demand line is elastic and therefore increase in price means people will move to the revenue will go down and consumers will switch to the price. So again, if you if you go back to this graph, if you see if the farm decides that suddenly they decide they will charge higher prices, what will happen is the consumers are more responsive to this price change. So what will happen? They will just switch to the competitors. Uh, my consumers will just switch to Ishita, my uh, Dauda, to Diego. So as a result, I will have a decrease in my revenue because consumers are switching. But in the case, if I lower my price, what will happen? Consumers are less insensitive. Um, and other farms, basically when I will reduce my price, the others will also follow me and they will also reduce the price in, in this type of oligopoly market structure. So there is a agreement between the firms to change the price and that's why we don't operate at MR is equal to MC in this type of market structure. 
All right, some of the advantages of oligopoly, we need to know this, the advantages and disadvantages of oligopoly. So the advantages, some of the advantages of oligopoly is it basically offers some advantages to firms that make large capital investments, right? It provides them with some protection. So I am making a lot of investment, a lot of money I'm spending to, to start my automobile uh, business or to start my airline industry. So I, I obviously I expect some level of protection. I don't want to go out of business easily because I spend so much money in this form. So this type of market structure does offer some sort of protection. We, can, we, we are not um, exposed to too much uh, competition. Not anyone can easily come into the market. Competition is limited and price changes are very very infrequent we don't have to change our prices because they um, because price war is not there in this type of market structure also technology related manufacturing requires large investment and much R&D to maintain a competitive operation and it also allows for more firms if we compare it to a monopoly there's only one firm operating here whereas the oligopoly usually accommodates four or five or nine or ten firms operating in this type of market structure now, what are the disadvantages of oligopoly? The main disadvantage of oligopoly is this: there is no government interference. The government does not um, control this type of market structure, and therefore, there, it, it, it's also there is no efficiency in the market. There's, it's very inefficient. Firms in this type of model can be inefficient, and fewer government restrictions um, than monopoly. But you know, they maintain their market power because of only few firms operating in the market. So, you know, with globalization, some firms in the steel and automobile industry are facing more competition. You know, of course, uh, Ford um, is uh, facing competition from Toyota, Honda, you know, because of globalization and international trade. Um, but overall, that's what we are trying to say here. So that's the end of the lecture. We will stop here. And, uh, you know, this week you also have a homework due, uh, homework assigned, and that will be due on April 21st. It's based on lecture 12 and lecture 13. So if you have any question, feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, you guys have a good day, and I will be back soon. Thank you.